Take your Bibles and go to Daniel, please. And tonight we're going to not be reading from the board. You're going to have a lot of scriptures to be looking over, but none of them are going to be on the board. The outline will be. But Daniel chapter number 10, 11, and 12 is really one vision and some instruction that God gives to Daniel. Daniel is wrapping up his prophetic ministry, and God records a final vision that Daniel has that has to do with his people, but also with a time that's even beyond us. The text that we're going to be looking at has three sections. First of all, there's going to be the preparation for the vision. Then there's going to be contents of the vision. And finally, some final instructions that God gives to Daniel. So first of all, let's talk about the preparation for the vision. In chapter 10, verse 1, Daniel says it's in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message uh, was revealed to Daniel, whose name was also Belshazzar. The message was true. The appointed time was long. That means it's going to be a long time before it comes to pass. And, and, and Daniel understood the message and had understanding of that vision. So God's given him a vision that he could pretty well get and grasp, but it caused him to have some difficulty. Uh, the historical setting of this is that it's happening in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. It doesn't mean a whole lot except it's right around 536 to 535 B.C. That's important because in 536, Cyrus made a decree for the people to go back to Israel. Daniel's going to be in mourning. He's going to be fasting. He's going to be praying. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But it's a difficult time in Daniel's life. Number one, he can't go back with them. He's over 80 years old. It's going to be too hard of a journey. But he gets to see his people go back, and he's excited about that, except only 42,600 decide to go back. And of that 42,600 that go back with Zerubbabel, who is the leader, the governor, if you will, the high priest is Joshua at that time, only 4,260 are priests. And they're going to start an entire nation. Once again, this was a nation of millions and millions that are now just a handful of people that are going to go back. The work is slow. There's many obstacles. Daniel's also about this time is when we believe that Daniel's encounter with the lion's den happens. It's almost about this exact time. So I don't know if that happens right before this or right after this, but it's happening about that exact same time that Daniel is going to be thrown into the lion's den. So that's the historical setting. It's at that time in Daniel's life. The physical circumstances is that he has spent 21 days in prayer. He's been praying about what's going on. Again, I believe praying for his nation, fasting, trying to see what God is doing, not too pleased with the fact that not many are going back. The spiritual encounter that takes place, takes place in verse 5 through 9. First of all, in 5 through 9, there's a vision of Christ. This is, by my estimation, this is the fourth, at least, possibly the fifth time Jesus shows up in the book of Daniel. Uh, can anybody remember the first time he showed up? Had to do with some fire. Yeah, the fiery furnace, remember? The one man that was in the furnace already, and when the three were thrown in there, there's four, and the fourth is likened unto the Son of God. We believe that's Jesus in the fiery furnace. And they came out of the fiery furnace untouched, unscathed, because Jesus was there with them and protected them. But then we saw him also uh, in various places. He was the one in chapter number 7, verse 13 and 14, who was the glorious one that came from heaven to sit upon a throne that was going to rule over the kingdoms of the earth forever and ever. We saw him again in chapter 8, verse 15 and following. Um, probably chapter 9, I believe, was also Messiah the Prince when he talked about Messiah the Prince who is to come. And so this is the fifth occasion, uh, possibly, that he shows up. And it's a glorious vision of Jesus here. I'm not going to take time to describe that vision because it's like most of the visions, it's indescribable. But it's bright, it's beautiful, and it's of a one that looks like a man, and yet we know it to be the Lord. Then there's another thing that happens in verse number 10 and following all the way through the rest of this chapter, and that is he is so overwhelmed by what took place in the vision overwhelmed by the circumstances which he's living under, overwhelmed by the fact he hasn't really eaten anything 
for 21 days. And by the way, in the midst of that 21 days, 10 days before this event happens we're going to talk about, was the Passover. So he even fasted through the Passover. He didn't celebrate the Passover. This was a very difficult time in Daniel's life as he sees his life coming to an end. And everything seems to be saying, my people, the, God, the people of God, are not responding to God the way they need to. And there's some difficulties that's going to come upon God's people again in the future. He sees these things in a vision. And so his strength is completely given out. He falls on the ground as if he's a dead man. He just basically is, is completely without energy. He won't look up at this vision. But another individual, and this is not Jesus... I believe, though it doesn't call him by name because he's already showed up twice, I believe this is Gabriel, the archangel, and we'll talk more about that. But this angel shows up and comes up and touches him and gives him strength and says, now rise up. I'm going to show you some things that are going to take place. So he has this vision of, these, uh, of this uh, angelical being that comes uh, in at this point in time. Now that gives me an opportunity at this time to talk about some things about angels. We've seen this is the third occasion angel shows up. We're going to see some other angels mentioned in these verses. I'm not going to read much of them except look down to verse number 013. Uh, well, let's start in verse 12. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel. Now this is the angel speaking to Daniel. And again, I believe it's probably Gabriel, the Annunciation angel. Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Now, William just say, sang a song that when we as believers bow down to pray, then Satan's already lost the battle. But there is a battle going on. And what this angel is saying, and this, is, this really bothered me for years, and I really still have struggles about how all this goes on. But from the first time Daniel began to pray and to fast, seeking God for information, God sent a messenger angel, I believe Gabriel. But it took him 21 days to get there. Is it that far from heaven? No, these guys move like speed lightning. Okay, they, they can be here very quickly. They're not omnipresent. They can't be everywhere at the same time, but they move very quickly. But he was sent with the answer and with encouragement to Daniel. And I believe with this vision that it was Daniel is going to be able to, to get an interpretation of. But notice verse 13. Why did it take so long for him to get there? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. In other words, when I was coming, I encountered a spiritual force. Let me call them those who rule over Persia. Now, he's not talking about human resistance here. He's talking about angelical beings that have taken over a country known as Persia. It seems to me, as you look through Scripture, every nation has influences of demonic forces trying to over, overrun that nation. I believe, on the other hand, God puts good angels. Angels that have not fallen, that did not follow Lucifer. But good angels are also there to watch over and to protect. And there is a spiritual battle going on. And at this point, and I don't know if it's because Daniel's been praying, as we saw back in chapter number 7. He's been praying for his people, praying for the restoration of Jerusalem. He's been seeking God in all these things. I don't know all that's going on that Daniel's been praying about, but it was a particular uh, prayer for God's people to flourish, to be blessed of God. And somehow this demonic forces came to prevent him from getting that answer through. Now, couldn't God just speak directly? He could, and sometimes he does to individuals. But on this occasion, he sent a ministering angel, and there was a spiritual battle taking place between Gabriel, if it is Gabriel, and the prince of Persia, and some demonic forces. And he says, I couldn't prevail over him by myself. And so Michael shows up, and we know Michael shows up several places in Daniel, 
And some other places in the book of Jude, it talks about Michael doing battle with Satan, with Lucifer. And he's called an archangel. And so there's this spiritual battle that goes on when Daniel would spend that time in prayer in the morning, at lunch, and then in the evening time. Daniel was somehow taking part in spiritual warfare. I do not understand it all. In fact, I have a lack of faith sometimes to believe that prayer doesn't really have that big an impact upon the world around us. Sometimes I wonder if praying, because I prayed for things, I've been praying for things that have not come to pass since the day I was saved. I've been praying for some things to come to pass that haven't come to pass. It doesn't mean I need to quit praying, and God has given me an answer, and it's been no so far, and I'm hoping that will change on some issues. But we just, there's somehow, we engage in spiritual warfare, and we do it by praying. Tomorrow, I'm going to be going up to Falls Creek to teach the young children uh, the Bible lesson. It's the New Testament's on uh, Ephesians chapter number 6, verse 10 through 20. And most of you know that when you get to the final chapter of Ephesians, Paul moves to spiritual warfare. And he tells them to put on, to be girded with truth, to put on the breastplate of righteousness, to put on the helmet of salvation, take up the shield of faith and the sword of the Lord, which is God's holy word, be shod on your feet with the gospel of peace and get all this battle armor ready and once you've got ready, does anyone remember what he tells you to do? Pray. Pray. You would think he would say, now get out there and fight. Well, and, and we do have to do that. But you never do that before prayer. Because see, somehow, in some way, that's a mystery to at least this pastor, our praying has an impact upon nations even, and governments and what's going on. My personal belief is that every nation, every nation has demonic forces trying to infiltrate the leadership. And every nation has angelical beings, if you will, trying to say, no, you don't want to go that way. And trying to influence it for good. For instance, I believe that demonic forces were used by God and God allowing it because it was the will of God for Allowing the nation of Babylon, stirring up the nation of Babylon. And by the way, I think he even stirred up the king of Israel to rebel against Babylon. So that, the, so that Israel would be destroyed. He stirred up this angelical being that is a fallen angel. Stirred up probably the kings of Babylon to come and destroy. But just as surely as that takes place, I believe God through an angel stirred up the heart of Cyrus the king of Persia. To destroy the Babylonians. And then he stirred up the heart of the king of Persia. Cyrus by name. To give a decree. To let the Israelites go back to their land. He'll stir up kings for whatever purpose. And God uses these angelical beings. And, and lets these uh, angels and these demonic forces to do battle. Now don't think that they're as powerful as God. But they are powerful. There's three particular powerful angels, and this is Donnie's take. Don't go to the mat with anybody on this. But there's three angels mentioned in the Bible. I believe each one of them were an archangel. We know that Gabriel is, and we know that Michael is. I believe that Lucifer was the third archangel. And when Lucifer had a third of the angels under him, Gabriel probably has a third of the angels under him, and Michael probably has a third of the angels under him. Donnie's belief is, is Michael relates to God the Father. Gabriel to the Holy Spirit and Lucifer to Jesus. Now, don't get too divided in the Trinity. But it seems to be that these were ministering angels. And the Father had a third. The Holy Spirit has a third. And Christ has a third. Christ's third rebelled. They followed Lucifer. We know him as Satan, the adversary. We know him as the devil. And a third of the angels were taken with him, and that is the demons that were taken with him, the fallen angels. Now God is restoring, ministering, and we're not going to ever be an angel. Don't ever think we become angels. We don't. We are human beings. In fact, we have been made a little lower than the angels, but we shall be elevated above the angels. But we will be those that minister to Christ throughout all eternity. In a sense... 
though not literal, we're replacing the angels that have fallen away and we're going to minister to Christ throughout all of eternity. We, particularly those of us in the church age, we're going to be known as his bride. The others will be known as the friends of the Father. And so there's this great battle that's going on and we get a kind of a glimpse into this uh, battle. Now, don't think for a moment that things are on edge as whether or not God can win this thing. Listen to this quote. It comes from the Expositor's Bible uh, commentary. Uh, Archer wrote this. I quote, While God can, of course, override the united resistance of all the forces of hell if he chooses to do so, he accords the demons certain limited powers of obstruction and rebellion, somewhat like those he allows humans. In both cases, the exercise of free will in opposition of the Lord of heaven is permitted by him when he sees fit. When he sees fit. But as Job 1.12 and also chapter 2 verse 6 indicate, the malignity of Satan is never allowed to go beyond the due limit set by God. End quote. And so don't think that the universe is kind of out here and God is working and Satan is working and somehow God's just barely going to win this thing. Folks, we are super victorious. We, as someone said, we're not kicking a field goal at the end of the game to win this thing. It's already done. We've won by a million points, okay? They didn't even get into the game. Jesus kicked them out. They, they forfeit. And so the game is over with. We, we've won this thing. But God allows these angels, and Daniel is one of the books we see, the inner workings of these angels, these angelical beings, both good angels and bad angels, as they are allowed to do some of the ministry and things that God has uh, for us. Now, what, what does that mean to you and I? I, I believe the America ha, has been blessed. In fact, I think that God put angels around us to protect us during the civil, uh, excuse me, during the uh, American Revolution, uh, the Revolutionary War, uh, there was some protection. There were some wonderful things that happened that you just can't explain except the hand of God had done it. Same thing was with World War I and World War II. I guess you do know that those battles were, at some t point in time, we weren't even sure who was going to win that, the Axis or the Allies. It, there were times, I'm told when you read back, that it just wasn't predetermined who was going to win this thing. And yet God moved in some mysterious and wonderful ways that we uh, were protected. And we've been blessed. We've been blessed. But for those of you that have been studying out of the book of Ezekiel with me on Wednesday night, remember those six angels that were protecting the, the city of Jerusalem? And God calls to himself. And then God gives them the instruction, now go out and destroy the nation and destroy Jerusalem. There comes a time when God removes his ministering angels and Satan begins to take control and darkness begins to overwhelm a culture and decadence becomes the calling card of that culture. Oh, folks, we, we better start praying. We better start doing this. God's people better, who are called by his name, we better humble ourselves as Daniel did. We better pray. We better seek God's face. And we better turn from our wicked ways so that God can hear our, forgive our sins, hear, hear our prayers, and forgive our land. Because I believe we are on a pre precipice right now in America. And it just seems like to me we're just almost too far gone. But pray. Pray that God might restore. And that's what we can do. If nothing else, pray. Because we know greater is he who lives in us than he who lives in the world. Now there's a second thing. That's the preparation for the vision that he's going to receive. The vision itself, the contents of that vision, begins in chapter number 11, verse number 2, and goes to chapter 12, verse 3. This passage is one of the most amazing passages in all of Scripture because it reveals a very minute detail what's going to happen several centuries after Daniel. Daniel sees some things so vividly that are given to him and he records these things that every minute detail can be, you, looking back over history, you can see how it was fulfilled. Even Cleopatra shows up in this. She's the, she's the daughter of Egypt that shows up in this. Doesn't give her by name, but we see her in this. And it's some amazing things. Now, I'm not going to go through this. It can be divided. Uh, well, let me just read about 
a, a quote from Campbell. In his commentary, this is what he says about these verses. I didn't look through here, uh, but I'm going to take his word for it. I quote, In the first 35 verses, there are at least 135 prophecies which have been literally fulfilled and can be corroborated by a study of history of that period, end quote. You get that? 135 prophecies, according to him, are fulfilled in those 35 verses that have already come to pass. Now that would be chapter number, actually going back to verse number 1, but it, chapter number 11, verse 2 through 35, have already come to pass. Um, the overview of the entire Persian rule is actually given here, and even into the Grecian rule. So really you have almost 400 years of history uh, that this covers. Notice in verse number 2, he says three more kings are going to come after Cyrus. We know those kings. Camesus, who is Cyrus's son, came after him. Then there was Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes is the one that revokes the building permit. He's the one that they convince, the enemies convince, to stop the building that's going on in Jerusalem. And so he sends a decree telling the Jews, stop it. Quit building. You're rebelling. Remember, they sent a letter back eventually to another king and said, hey, uh, we were given permission by Cyrus to, to do these things. And so it was reestablished by the next king, who was Darius Hastaphus. And uh, by the way, you'll find this in the Ezra chapter number 6. And he's the one that renews. It's not the Darius that uh, has to throw Daniel into the lion's den. It's several kings down the line. Darius Hestaphus. Then he says there will be a fourth king that will come. That is a great, great king of the Persians. We know him as Xerxes. Xerxes the Great. He's also called Ahasuerus. And uh, anybody remember who he marries? Esther. Yes, he's the one that divorces uh, Vashti, marries Esther, and is the one that preserves the life of the Jews. And he was an amazing king, probably one of the richest kings ever to live. He controlled literally the entire world. One man controlling the world. It is said about Xerxes that he had five million men in his army. Now, compared to David's army, which at times had 800,000, uh, 800, and sometimes his army would be numbered, it was a little over 100,000. Uh, uh, this uh, 100,000, this guy had 5 million men in his army. And three times he goes against the Greeks. Many of you probably watched the movie or heard about the movie 300, uh, the Battle of Thermopylae uh, with Leonidas and so forth. Uh, that was one of the battles that uh, they went into and were overwhelmed because this man literally would send off a million men at a time on these jaunts. And so he's the fourth king that it talks about. Now, then I want you to notice in verse number three, a mighty king will arise who will destroy him. And that was Alexander the Great. He will be moved with rage, it says. And uh, he's the ram of Daniel chapter number eight. We've already looked at all that. And he will divide his country, it says, into four individuals. We've already looked at that. That happened exactly like it was said. He died very young. Alexander the Great died very young, 32 years old. His kingdom, just as Scripture says here, would be divided in four ways. Daniel has already received that information, has already understanding of that information, but it's being reviewed. And then the remainder, that is verses 5 through 35, is the Seleucus and the Ptolemy dynasty. Those are two of the Greek dynasties. There's four of them. There's, there's four different regions. Each one had a king over it. It was divided after Alexander. Two of those, the Seleucus and Ptolemies, is north and south. Now that's the only one that really mattered to Daniel because it goes back from that verse all the way to verse number 35 that these king of the north, this king of the south, do battle and it oftentimes interrupts the life of Israel. Until there's one that comes that he describes, and we already talked about him. His name is Antiochus Epiphanes, who comes and sets himself against the holy place and against the holy people. He's mentioned in verse number 31, forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices, 
and place there the abomination of desolation. Now, I'm not going to go over that before, for you again because I know all these details just get jumbled up in your mind. Just know the reason why Daniel is receiving this information and why he again falls down at the end of this is because of the amazing desolation that is coming upon the Jewish people. And Daniel sees all this. There's very little that Daniel gets to see until the very end that's great, and that is the coming Messiah. But he's way on down the line. But the Jews must go through many, many problems and difficulties. Now, why would God include that? Well, number one, for the Jews' sake. So they'll know that this is what God has ordained for them. And it's because of wickedness in their lives that this has been ordained. But number two, doesn't this give you such a, a strong faith in the Word of God? That if 300 to 400 years before something happens, God tells you minutely how it's going to happen? And if God doesn't give up on Israel, even though she has failed and faltered and she's done so many wicked things, God never gives up on her. Don't you know that God's not going to give up on the church? He's not going to give up on you and I. If we are true believers filled with the Holy Spirit of God, I can't lose that. God is faithful to his covenants. God is faithful to his promises. And though Israel has to go through a lot of difficulties and problems when she gets outside the will of God, when she rejects the word of God, and when she won't listen to her prophets, she has to pay for that. God never cast her aside completely. And by the way, he never will. He never will. Israel has a covenant with God, and God will fulfill that covenant. Now, for the sake of time, let me just say that beginning in verse number 36 through 39, though some people disagree, uh, he moves from talking about the king at the end of the Grecian time, this Antiochus Epiphanes, he moves to the ultimate Antichrist. I believe this describes the Antichrist that's coming at the end of the Roman period, one even beyond our time. So verse 36 and following are beyond our time for the most part. They haven't happened yet. And verse number 36, the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. Shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. Now that does describe Antiochus Epiphanes. That does describe Antiochus Epiphanes. But I believe he's also talking about the rise of an Antichrist. And let me show you that here in just a moment why I think that. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Now some believe this means he either will have no sexual desire whatsoever or he'll be homosexual. Okay. Nor, reg nor does he regard any God. For he shall exalt himself above them all. But he shall... But in their place, he shall honor a God of fortresses. In other words, he is going to, his entire life is wrapped up in war. Preparing for war for three and a half years and then letting loose that war upon the world in the last three and a half years. More to come about that. So this is the, the little horn that was, we were introduced back in chapter number seven. Uh, it talks about, I think in those verses after that, a gathering of a great war. That could be in the days of Antiochus. That could be. The, uh, uh, the people who, who came in and, and threw off the rule of the uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. But I believe he's also talking about a, one to come, a, a war to come. But look in chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. So who is Israel's guardian angel? Michael. That he's assigned, this mighty angel, Michael, is assigned to Israel, to watch over Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been, uh, never was since the, there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now, I'm going to come back next week and, and hit verse number four and hit some of those things. But I think this is a very key part of the passage. At that time, 
Now, he's not talking about at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes he'd been talking about, but he moved to the Antichrist and said, now, after the Antichrist comes, Daniel will rise up and he will defend the Jewish people. It's going to be a horrible time for the Jewish people. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to be heavily persecuted during that time. But Michael will rise up and will bring an end. Now, Jesus, we know, is going to, going to the one that's going to ultimately bring the end. But he's going to protect the Jews. Uh, Michael is going to protect the Jews. He says, after that will come a glorious resurrection. Now, we know that doesn't happen until the end. There's going to be a rapture of the church. And then for Israel, there will be a resurrection. But notice how he describes this resurrection. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth, he's not talking about soul sleep. What sleeps in the dirt? What do we plant in the dirt when we have a funeral? The body. Where's the soul? Where's the spirit? It's either in hell, awaiting its day of judgment, or the soul is with Jesus, who has redeemed it. One or the other. Okay? There's only two places. They're either in hell, or they're in, with Jesus in heaven today. And so... These are the ones he's talking about that are going to receive a resurrection. Well, if they're already alive, what's going to be raised? A body is going to be raised from the dead. And so we know that when you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that is described for the church at least. That's when the church will receive its body. That Christ will bring the soul, the spirit of those who are saved with him. And out of the dust of the earth, God is going to raise up a body. But notice here also, he throws all the resurrections together. There's going to be more than one resurrection, but he throws them all together. He's not trying to be technical. He's just saying, after the Antichrist is destroyed, then will come the resurrections, okay? Now, he also says in that, that those who have done evil, some to shame and everlasting contempt, he has said, which agrees with what Paul teaches, which agrees, by the way, with what Jesus taught. Everyone is going to be raised from the dead. Everyone is going to receive a new body. Ours are going to be glorious bodies likened unto our Lord's glorified body. A body made so our soul, our spirit, can be housed throughout eternity. That we not be able to feel any pain. We'll not be able to go through any rebellion. Uh, We'll be perfect just as Jesus is perfect. We'll have a perfect righteousness Because his righteousness has been established in us. And his righteousness is perfect. perfect. But the unbeliever will also be raised from the dead. We'll have a body. That soul, that spirit will enter that body. And that body can feel nothing but pain. It will always be in agony. Not because God is not a God of love. But because they have rebelled against the God who created them. And even when he revealed himself to them through creation and through conscience and through those who have gone as witnesses and talked to them and they have rejected and they have done wicked and they have set themselves against the plan of God in this world, they shall be punished. But notice verse 3. What should be our desire right now then? If this is true and we're going to be raised and we're going to receive a body, what should be our desire Verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of his firmament. To the degree that you shine for the glory of God today will be the degree that you'll shine for the glory of God in eternity. Okay? Those that don't shine very brightly will be in heaven, but they're not going to shine very brightly. But those who, who are wise will shine brightly in the kingdom of God. They were light of the world while they were down here, and they will be light. Throughout all of eternity. What you do down here matters. How you spend your time. How you spend your energy. How you spend your money. How you raise your kids. How you treat your spouse. All the the words that come out of your mouth. The attitude with which you approach God's ministry. All these things are working together. And are built into the new body you're going to have. And so those that are wise are going to shine brightly. But notice this. And those who turn many, 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 many to right, they're going to shine like the stars forever and ever. So what's the key job of a Christian? Turn people away from sin and under righteousness. Call it evangelism. Call it what you want to. But the way we live, and we're to make him known. 
We're to call people away from the destruction that this describes for the unbeliever. We're to call them to righteousness, to holiness. We're not calling them to join a church. We're calling them to leave sin behind and to come and be righteous that only Christ can provide. Not through works, but through His death and burial and resurrection. And so, let's look at the final instruction given to Daniel. The final instruction. It begins in verse number 4. And he tells Daniel to shut up the words of this book. Seal it. Seal the prophecies. It's too difficult to get. But in the end, you'll get it. Now, I'll, Lord willing, going to come back and we're going to get that next Sunday night. Lord willing. But, Daniel then stood there, some men showed up, and he asked the question, how long shall be the fulfillment of these wonders? And they talked about it. How long is this going to be going on? And he says in verse number 7, again, something that we've already looked at in the book of Daniel, it'll be a time, times, and half a time. In other words, the destruction that's coming upon Israel, the final destruction, the final time when antichrist is let loose and he brings this this abomination of desolation and he, and he brings this destruction upon israel it's going to be a time two times and a half a time so three and a half years three and a half years you say well donnie are you sure okay let's look down he also gives another figure look down just a little bit further and uh look at uh verse number 11 and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and, and Satan, by the way, or Antichrist will take that away at three and a half years. Three and a half years into the tribulation period. The first three and a half years he's gathering for battle. At three and a half years, he's going to do the abomination of desolation. So after three and a half years, after the abomination of desolation, that gives us seven years. That's a seven year tribulation period. But notice this. From that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, an abomination of desolation is set up there shall be 1,290 days. Now, if you're figuring that out, that is three and a half years plus one month. Okay? Now, what specifically is going to happen one month after the Battle of Armageddon? I don't know. I would be guessing. My guess is that is when Jesus is going to call the nations probably to him and going to be a judgment of the nations. It could be the coronation of Jesus upon the earth. I don't know. But then he talks about, notice in the next verse, 12, 1,335 days. So that's the three and a half years plus another 75 days. What significance is going to happen there? He said, blesses the man. I don't know. Those are things not revealed to us. But it just tells us this, that once God has destroyed the Antichrist and he's cast into hell, God has a plan and a program after that. One of those things we do know is Jesus will be seated on the throne. He will be recognized by the entire world. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His kingdom will be inaugurated. Nations will come before him, be judged. The sheep will be separated from the goats. The sheep will enter into the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. The goats will be cast into hell. I don't know all that's beyond that. Just say this, God has a plan. And what we're looking for is we're not looking for the coming of the Antichrist. We're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we want to be a part of his kingdom. But Satan has a part that God allows him to play in these days. One final thing and I'm done. Notice verse number 13, the very end of it. As God gives the final assurance to Daniel, he says this, but you, Daniel, he doesn't give his name here, but, but you go your way till the end for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. He promises him a resurrection. Daniel, you're my servant and you're going to have a resurrection. How about you? Are you going to be, are you going to be, are you going to be, are you going to be,